to try to mimic a myocardial infarction in a mouse. Now, mice actually don't like McDonald's. They don't eat rich food. It's really hard to get them to go into some sort of atherosclerosis. Um, they're not really fond of high cholesterol. They like carrots, unlike Doug. And they, um, therefore, ha you have to do something else. So what we do is we put a little string around the, or the coronary artery and tie it down a bit as if there was a clot in there. And that gives them the equivalent of a myocardial infarction as seen on the right. Now, we then can follow to see whether the animals that had the growth factor do better than the animals without. So on the left, you see a mouse heart that looks normal with a ventricle, the big left ventricle, in a cross section. And on the right, you see a control um, in which we opened up the mouse and gave it a myocardial infarction, closed it up and waited for a couple of months, and then looked at it again. And you can see that this mouse has very nasty heart failure. That thin wall is exactly what patients look like after they've had a myocardial infarction and waited a long time. Now, a myocardial infarction, the same myocardial infarction technique on one of these animals that we had engineered to express the growth factor didn't appear to have the same response at all. And as you can see in the lower left-hand panel, there was a rather miraculous recovery. In fact, it reminded us, perhaps hopefully, of the way the zebrafish regenerates. And so we believe then that the way in which the growth factor works is somehow to retain some of the tricks of evolution that we've lost and go back to being able to regenerate the heart. And if you look at the actual cellular basis of this, I've done it as a cartoon here. On the left, you're familiar with this picture. It's a scar. It's, it's going to eventually cause problems for this mouse. On the right, we have brand new cells. We have a vessel going through it. And essentially, we're on our way to a complete recovery. Now, how could IGF-1 be helping? Well, one thing that we noticed is that IGF-1 overexpressing animals appeared to express a number of molecules that we associate with homing. And there are growth factors and all sorts of other ways in which we can find uh, tracks of cells that are preferentially drawn to regions of injury. And in fact, that's exactly what we saw, that these attractive molecules called chemokines were expressed at quite high levels in these animals. Finally, before I finish, I'd like to just mention a very, very new result, literally two weeks old. So I threw these slides together literally over the last two days to show them to you, because I think it's very exciting and it brings home a point that warms the cockles of my heart. And that is a, an experiment that was done by Paul Riley recently in which he tested the capacity for a molecule called thymosin beta-4, which is actually a molecule that helps cells rearrange their cytoskeleton, their shape, to help with the capacity for a mammalian mouse heart to regenerate. And what he found, in a word, was that injecting this molecule into the mouse's heart created a much better environment. In fact, it looked a bit like what happened when we overexpressed the IGF-1 gene. And when he looked in detail at how this actually occurred, it was uh, really astounding because the thymus in beta-4 was activating that epicardial layer just like the zebrafish does. And so it appeared that we were beginning to have a pathway here that we could actually start to imagine looks like a zebrafish regeneration pathway that we could artificially induce in a human heart. So we imagine that thymus in beta-4 might activate the epicardium to make new blood vessels. We know that FGF is another factor that we can deliver that might actually then turn those newly, f newly activated epicardial cells into cells that can actually make blood vessel cells, endothelial cells. And eventually, then, hopefully, we can understand how, with the IGF-1 gene, we might be able to build new, blood, uh, build new heart muscle itself. So in fact, we believe that there might be ways in which we could replace cells. We might be able to stimulate the heart to make new cells. And we can even keep it alive by improving the way in which the hearts revascularize their tissue using this rather amazingly reminiscent uh, uh, protocol that looks for all the world like a protocol that the zebrafish has used by definition. Anyway, just to finish off then, here are some of the ways in which 
cells might be used to cure heart disease. And in many ways, you can think of many organs standing in for this heart because the ideas are the same. The ideas come from the possibility for cells within the tissue itself to regenerate and how can we activate those. Cells that might be available that we're not even aware of within a tissue that could be cajoled into helping out. And finally, cells that might come in secreting different factors that could help us to uh, convince the heart that it actually could regenerate in a better way. Now, before I close and take questions, I'd like to uh, just acknowledge the fact that I have a rather extraordinary group of people to thank, which are my own lab. And I have to tell you that they're watching this from Italy. They called me yesterday and told me that I was a disgrace for the t-shirt episode. <laughs> and that if I didn't do better, I wasn't allowed back. But I mean, in all honesty, that they've been wonderful in letting me out of school for a couple of days to come and talk to you. And um, it's really a pleasure to have uh, young people in our laboratories who get as excited about science as we do. And I'd just like to acknowledge all those wonderful people in a rather salubrious environment in a small trattoria in Rome. And now I'll take questions. Yes. Um, with heart transplants, do blood types still play an important role in them? With heart transplants, blood types do play an important role. And in fact, uh, the capacity to, with, uh, to hold on to a transplanted heart is largely dependent on how well that heart is matched at a number of immune levels. So um, thanks all very much. And I'm going to now turn the podium over to Tom Schreck. Nadia, thanks for another great lecture. I want to thank everyone for a very successful holiday lecture series. Thanks to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute staff, to our production team, especially to you, the student audience, for all of your great questions. And let's have one more round of applause for our terrific speakers. Now, how, how about next year? Well, our topic for next year's holiday lecture series is HIV and the global AIDS epidemic. <laughs> Hughes investigator Bruce Walker from Harvard Medical School will be joined by his colleague Bisola Ojikutu from South Africa. And they will present four lectures talking about how the AIDS epidemic got started, what the virus is like, how it became an epidemic, and what we can do in terms of prevention and treatment. So we hope to see all of you next year. Until then, have a great holiday season.